get started. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Rowan Payne. I'm from uh, Digital New Zealand in uh, the National Library of New Zealand, Te Puna Mata Ranga o Aotearoa. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. We've got a really uh, fantastic turnout for this talk, our rich resource to share national libraries on their digital curation work, making collections computationally accessible. Uh, this is brought to you by the Australian New Zealand chapter of AI for LAM. Um, I, we're going to kick off in a, in a moment. Um, I'd just like to start with a, um, a brief acknowledgement. Uh, kia koutou ngā maunga, ngā awa, ngā waka, ngā tūpuna o Aotearoa me te whenua moi moi a e hui hui mai nei, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, that uh, translates as to you, the mountains, rivers, waka, ancestors of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the land of the dreaming, Australia, that are gathered here and greetings to you all, and also to all of those of you joining us from further afield. Um, welcome. Uh, so I will uh, pass over to um, Alexis, my co-presenter, uh, oh. and we'll kick off the program. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks very much for that. And um, uh, today uh, in Australia, we're celebrating NAIDOC Week. So today more than ever, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the ancestral lands from which I join you today. I acknowledge their deep relationship with country and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Um, as Rowan mentioned, our participants, a large number of them today are coming in from all over the place. So I extend that respect to relevant communities in other regions. And I especially say welcome to any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, or other First Nations people who are joining us today. So this is the latest chapter, uh, the latest webinar from the Australian and Aotearoa New Zealand chapter of uh, Artificial Intelligence for Libraries, Archives and Museums. I'm going to get through a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So um, just letting you know that today's session will be recorded and posted online um, after it finishes. You'll be sent a, a link to that recording if you want to revisit or pass it on to friends. Um, I think I was going to invite people to use the chat function to introduce themselves, but they're taking that up with gusto. So lovely to see where you're all coming from today. And feel free to use the chat function to ask questions at any point through the, during the webinar today. Um, the first half of our webinar will be um, a pre-recorded uh, presentation from Sarah Ames, who was kind enough to join us from Scotland. It is near impossible to get a time that mutually suits New Zealand and Scotland for people to, uh, to sensibly present together. So we've got that pre-recorded, but Rowan and I have asked a couple of questions on her on your behalf at the end of her presentation. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll hear from Jess Moran from the National Library of New Zealand. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah. Sarah is a digital scholarship librarian at the National National Library of Scotland with responsibility for the library's digital scholarship service and data foundry. She's also associated in various roles with the Libra DH Working Group, the Research Library UK's Digital Shift Working Group and Digital Scholarship Network and the Alan Turing Institute Humanities and Data Science Group. She has a PhD in English Literature um, and has worked in library environments for a decade, primarily in taking services from early stage programs to business as usual activity. So I'll just get that video going and Rowan and I will disappear. Uh, of course, yep. And we will rejoin you at the end of Sarah's presentation. Bear with us, it is coming. Well, thanks very much for having me along here today. Um, I'm Sarah Ames. I'm Digital Scholarship Librarian at the National Library of Scotland. And today I'm going to talk about our Digital Scholarship Service. I'll talk about some of our collections as data work, um, our engagement activity, and I'll try and get a bit of AI into it as well. Um, so firstly, a really quick overview of the National Library of Scotland. This is a super quick one. As you can see, it's very brief. 
Um, so we're a pretty big library. We've got over 31 million items in the collection, and that doesn't include a lot of our digital collections like the web archive. Um, so there's a lot of fodder here for digital scholarship and, and potential and opportunities. Um, we've been working for the last maybe seven years or eight years or so to a one third digital strategic aim by 2025. So 20, 2025 is our centenary year, and we've got an aim to have a third of our collections available in digital format by then. So part of that has been a big in-house mass digitization program. And this has created a lot of opportunities for digital scholarship. And I think it's really where the digital scholarship service idea first, um, first came from. And we're currently working to, um, I was about to say a new strategy, it's not new anymore, I guess, um, our 2020 to 2025 strategy called Reaching People, um, which has got a, a new focus on engaging new audiences through the collections. So um, bringing um, the collection or shedding new light on the collections and taking them out to communities, probably beyond the research community, I'd say. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities here for digital scholarship as well. So what I thought I'd do is talk a bit about our digital scholarship service, how we set it up, and some of our collections as data work as well. Um, so our digital scholarship service um, was set up in 2019. Um, it's got five main objectives, and the first one is around enabling the use of computational research methods with the collections. So this is really around making our collections available in, um, in machine-readable format as data. Um, and this helps us to uh, fulfill our second objective, which is around um, making sure that the collections are being used to their full potential. So we want to make sure that um, our collections are, are available for all uses, both analog and digital research. The third objective is maybe a bit more challenging. I think it's, it's an internal one. It's about establishing a culture in the library that understands digital scholarship, that's equipped to support digital scholarship. So we've got um, various training um, training opportunities and um, talks and things that we run to, to try and facilitate that. Um, and the third objective is around transparency in um, our data creation processes. So we're really aware that we're creating a lot of data sets um, and we have a lot of data coming off our own tools. So we've got in our mass digitization program, for example, we have data coming off our scanners, off our digital production tools, off our OCR software. And we're now packaging all of that up and making it available as our own collections, as our own data sets. And that's really problematic. Um, so we want to make sure, sure that we're really transparent about how and why we're doing that and what, what changes and what processes have gone into to our collections and what decision making has gone into it. The last objective, the fifth one, is around anticipating the future of research. Slightly ambitious, um, but we want to make sure that our collections stand the test of time and that they remain usable and relevant, um, even if technologies change or if methodologies change as well. Um, so there's three main areas of work around this service, and the first one is making data available. As you can imagine, as I'm sure you all know, there's, there's huge amounts of opportunities here at libraries, and particularly national libraries. So the main focus of our work at the moment has been on text and images because of our mass digitization program. But we're also doing um, a lot of work around metadata at the moment, and we're hoping to release our catalogue soon, or relatively soon. Um, we have organisational data that we make available. Um, such as financial data, for example. And we've got some challenges around things like maps and films. So what does a film look like as data? What does a map look like as data? If you could pull out all the foundries and castles and hills and rivers in a map, what would that mean for our users in terms of how they could search our collections? What would that mean as a data set? What would it look like? Um, and the same for films. So we're currently kind of thinking through those and, and working on them rather slowly, but we'll get there eventually, hopefully. Um, and then there's web archive data too, which has a lot of challenges around legal issues, but we have a project ongoing around that as well called the Archive of Tomorrow, which is a welcome funded project. Um, and that's, um, that's starting to explore those issues. The second area of activity for our digital scholarship service is um, external engagement, and that's um, getting out and about and talking to people about the service, and encouraging collaborative uses of the collections and projects. Um, we have PhD studentships, we have residencies like our artistic residencies, for example, and we have fellowships, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and we're also looking beyond the research community. So even though um, most of our uses are definitely um, researchers using our collections, we have interest from creatives. We think there's potential with schools, with business communities, and we need to think about how we can systematically roll out the service to those groups in the future. Then the third area of, of activities, internal engagement, and this is really about awareness raising within the library about what digital scholarship is and, and what it might mean for the library. Um, we offer training sessions for staff to um, in, improve their digital and data skills. Um, I seek out champions across the library who might say nice things about digital scholarship to, to their areas. And I think all of this is feeding into a broader culture change in the library around this digital shift that's happening across libraries at the moment. 
So those are the main three areas of activity that we work on. Um, I thought what I'd do is, is talk a bit um, about how we're making collections available as data, so particularly that first area at the moment, and our data foundry platform where we make them available. Um, so if I go back to square one about how we made the data foundry and how we went about this, um, we realised that we wanted to make our collections available as data to our users, but we were thinking about how best to do this. So this is a bit crude on the screen here. I've got to be clear that it, we don't normally categorize people into just three categories, but, but we looked into our user needs and um, crudely came up with three broad categories um, from beginner to advanced. I realized the wrong way around on the screen there, sorry. Um, so we've got these beginner users, for example, who don't have any technical skills um, and they just want text. Um, and they're going to be learning about how to use um, data sets, for example. But then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got these really advanced users who've got all the technical skills, and they will find a way to get hold of our collections and to use them no matter how they're presented, although they do have an expectation about standards, so we have to be a bit careful. Then in the middle is the slightly more complex user who has limited technical skills, but they do understand the value of of um, making collections available as data and of using them. They have ideas about research questions around them, but they maybe can't carry them out themselves. Um, and so we started to think about who we need to cater to, and we decided that we might want to cater to this, this broad middle user, this more complex one, because in doing that, um, we're dealing with the advanced user already, because hopefully they can, they can still accept, um, they can still use our data sets, but equally, um, we'll be um, serving some of the beginner users too, by making our, our collections available um, in simple ways, um, but we decided that we'd go for this middle ground user in general. Um, and hopefully that will become clearer as I go on. Um, so we then had to think about how to make our collections available as data. And again, um, this is very simplified on the screen, but um, this is um, a broad workflow of how you go from a print collection to a data collection and all the things that you need to think about in between, um, including rights and uh, what kind of images to make available, what um, file formats you need to think about, the metadata, any retro creation of, um, of file formats that you might need, where you might store them, um, creating digital object identifiers and then publishing them online. Um, so we, we worked out this workflow and um, involved quite a lot of change because our digitization program had been set up at this point to think about online image galleries. Um, it hadn't been set up to think about data sets. And so luckily our digitization um, team were able to make a few adjustments to the way they work. And, and we um, ended up um, coming up with this workflow to, to create our data sets for the data foundry. Um, so it has involved a bit of a shift in thinking. We then had to think about how to structure our data sets. Um, I won't even go through all the tortuous discussions around this that we had, but we ended up with C, if anybody's interested. Um, and we had to make decisions about our standards. So um, what standards we'd use for different kinds of data sets, how we'd um, make downloads available, um, what kind of image sizes and quality we'd include, where we'd store things, we're using AWS. Um, what kind of metadata we'd include, and then also how we can be transparent about what we've done and how we've gone about um, compiling our data sets. And we did, um, after making all these decisions, we then launched our data foundry back in September 2019 now, which feels a long time ago. Um, it's available at data.nls.uk, and if anybody um, wants to look at it and feedback, it would be great. And we're always um, welcoming feedback and how we can improve it. Um, it's, it's really a very simple platform. It's just a WordPress site. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, and it's got three main principles. The first one is around openness. So um, we make our data available openly and in reusable formats. The second one is around transparency, as I mentioned before. And the third one's around practicality. So we really want to make sure there aren't too many barriers to use. So we've gone for simple, straightforward downloads, the tiered downloads. We go for um, a variety of file formats where possible. So we have things like Alto XML, but we also have plain text um, for our beginner users, for example. Um, so, so we're really hoping, hoping that this can be as accessible as possible when it comes to a data platform. And it's been a whole library effort. So even though I'm the one who often goes out and talks about it, everybody in the library has really been involved in this um, right up to the National Librarian himself. So our previous National Librarian who retired last year, Dr. John Scally, came up with the title with the name of a data foundry. So we had this vision of a data foundry many years ago where you'd be able to melt down our collections and then weld them back together into new things. And so it's been a privilege to start to, to carry that vision out. But there's a lot of work still to go. So that was how we made collections available as data, and that's how we're still going about it. Um, I'm going to talk now about some of the engagement activity um, and some of the outcomes that we've had. I'm going to try and focus particularly on our AI related ones, but there may a few others may slip in as well, I think. Um, so we have an annual fellowship um, around digital scholarship, and our first fellow was Dr. Giles Burgle from the University of Oxford, 
who used computer vision tools with our chat books data set to um, explore the illustrations within chat books and start to look at um, the origins of the illustrations and where they've been shared across chat books. And he's really broken new ground with his research. There's information about it online there. And we're hoping on future projects around this. And it's been great to have these kind of collections used in um, with such exciting new tools that he's been developing with his team at Oxford, this, these BGG tools they're called. And we also our last fellow, Dr. Rosa Paguera from St. Andrews University, um, is creating an AI toolkit piece with the collections. She's just finishing off this project now. It's around our Encyclopedia Britannica dataset, which is a huge data set, um, very difficult for users um, to explore. And she's done some amazing work structuring this data set, creating an AI toolkit layer that sits on top of it. Um, and now users who don't have any coding skills and who don't have skills to use AI to explore the collections now can do that or will be able to do that soon when we launch it. So we're really excited about that. And I should say at this point, the annual fellowship that we have is a, a remote fellowship. So if anybody um, is interested from Australia, New Zealand, anywhere nearby, then um, please do um, get in touch or apply. We, um, we, have, um, we, we launch it every December. Um, so we should be advertising it again this December um, for the following year. And we have some PhD studentships too. I'm going to talk about the top one, Joe Knuckles' project, um, which is around Transcribus, the AI tool, the, the HGR tool that um, where we can start to um, make archival text available. Um, so Joe's going to spend um, six months with, with us very soon exploring how we could embed Transcribus into our digitization workflows um, going forwards and if it's even possible. Um, and um, he's also helped us to release our first AI generated data set using Transcribus onto the data foundry quite recently. So that was really exciting. Um, and we've had some artists working with our collections, which has been uh, a completely new way of thinking about the collections for us. So Martin Disley, a few years ago, there's his Twitter handle there, um, started to use GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, with the collections. And he um, carried out some initial experiments with our bridges collections, which are our flagship images for, for the data foundry website, and the fourth bridge and the Tay bridge. And he ended up with these kind of eerie mangled metal bridges that, that were created, these ghostly bridges, which was quite um, um, apt given that um, the Tay Bridge, was, which was one of the images he used, and there's a Tay Bridge disaster in the 19th century where it collapsed. And um, so it's um, there's these mangled metal images um, that somehow come out of the computer and, and recognize that that happened. Um, but his final project was around our map collections. And he had thousands of maps that he put through. Um, he trained um, a GAN with. And um, he created these um, images or maps of a Scotland that never existed in the first place, complete with these little compasses that point to a false north. Um, and he's done some amazing work with our collections. It's really worth looking him up and seeing what he's, he's been up to. But he's made us think about the collections um, or shed new light on the collections, let's say, um, in a way that we wouldn't have thought about them before. And we've also worked with Marion Carey, who's a Parisian artist. Um, who started to use, um, who used AI with our broadsides collection um, to explore the question around fake news, um, how we construct truth, how we construct archives. Um, and she um, displayed her work in Glasgow at the end of last year and also in Paris. Um, and we were really happy to be working with her and to have those kind of questions that are really um, topical at the moment being asked of our collections. And it's in encouraging a more critical engagement with collections than simply putting books in cases during it for exhibitions, for example. Um, and we're also currently working on an AI framework, or we're about to start working on one. So we've advertised an internship to help kick off this work with us. Um, so we recognise that AI is, is already within the way we work, whether we, we know it or not. And it's going to increasingly be a part of work in libraries. So we want to have a bit more coordinated approach to how the library adapts, uh, adapts to this and adopts this. Um, so we're going to do some research around what AI means in a library setting, what the ethical challenges might be, and, and how we can start to navigate these, particularly as a public facing library, um, and what our responsibilities are there. Um, what applications of AI that might be relevant to our library and what may not, and what tools we might choose to say we'll use and what ones maybe we won't at the moment. Um, and, and thinking about what this might mean for our collections and our services and what our next steps be so um, might be. So it's not um, not a small piece of work, but we're going to be kicking that off soon just to have a bit more coordination around this. And then I don't want to um, I don't want to linger on these ones for too long. This is I know is, is an AI um, community, but I'm going to talk briefly about some of the non AI um, related outputs. We've had some of my favorite ones recently. And um, this was one during lockdown in the UK. 
um, obviously people couldn't go to indoor exhibitions and we were working with some students um, who were creating data visualizations of some of our data sets and they've created these films of them and they're absolutely beautiful created over only a few months um, and they put them um, they, they created an on street exhibition in Edinburgh that you could see after dark and it, it was really amazing to see the collections being brought to the public um, in this kind of way. Um, we also have had some some other creative um, outputs from students. I find that often students have the most um, fascinating interpretations of the collection and ways of thinking about them that we never would have as librarians. Um, so this is actually a screenshot from a, a YouTube video, but it's on our, our website and please do go and have a look if you get a chance. So we had some students who decided to put Encyclopedia Britannica. Our, we've got a data set of 100 years of Encyclopedia Britannica and it's huge. They put it into Minecraft um, and they um, created a little roller coaster to navigate it with. You can go around this whole world of Encyclopedia Britannica in the real Minecraft, Minecraft system. You could then um, go in and click on these trees and learn a bit more about, about some of the topics. Um, and it was so creative and, and so interesting. And they had a little music video around it that they created. And it was really engaging and, and took Encyclopedia Britannica to new audiences, which is, is really one of our library's goals at the moment. Um, and then very recently, we've also released a LIDAR data set. So this is really moving from collections as data to the library itself as data. So during just before lockdown, sorry, we had Dr. Asad Khan from Edinburgh University come into the library and scan the library using LIDAR. Um, and um, this here is one of his visualizations of the point cloud data um, of our George IV Bridge main reading room. And um, they're all quite eerie, his visual visualizations of these empty library buildings. And we've got a visualization of the um, steps that go down under George IV Bridge where our books are stored in the library. And one of our subterranean stack levels here, and you can pretty just about, if you look carefully, see a sad down um, the corridor at the end there. Um, and he's done a number of visualizations around this, and we're quite keen to explore what, what's possible with this data set and whether we could work with um, computer game students, for example, around creating games in the library. So these are all um, projects available on, and featured on our projects page on the Data Foundry. And um, please do go, do go and have a look. And if you're interested in using our collections or um, want to flag up other projects, please do. That would be fantastic. Um, and I'm going to talk really briefly now about a couple more things, and then I'll, I'll close up because I can see that I'm coming to time here. So um, challenges around this kind of work. There's loads of challenges around collections as data work. I'm not going to talk about all these ones on the screen because there isn't time, but um, maybe I'll keep pick a couple of favorites um, which are for example change um, change is always a massive um, challenge um, in libraries in any, in any culture i guess um, and pe different people respond to change in different ways which can be challenging um, digital scholarship is involved change around workflows around culture around how we work together our processes so it has um has involved a lot of um, alterations across the board and and we've been fortunate that colleagues have, have been willing to adapt to things, but it's not been without challenge, definitely. Um, and another challenge that I'll talk about briefly is resourcing. Um, so we don't have any developers dedicated to our digital scholarship service, which is a real issue. And it's why um, we focus things largely externally to encourage others to use our collections to make it more sustainable. Um, but um, I, I'm really lucky that I do draw on some developer support sometimes as and when I can um, catch people's attention. And I've been very dependent on that. And it's, it's been really important for this work. Um, but having a developer, um, I think, would be really handy. So, so resourcing is a real issue that I think is, um, is facing all libraries in this area, as are all the other challenges there below, too. Um, what have we learned so far? So I'll start to wrap up here. Um, the first one is that you can do digital scholarship on a shoestring. I don't know if I'd recommend it, um, but if anybody from the NLS here is listening, then um, some dedicated developers would definitely be handy. But it is possible. Data Foundry, as I say, is a WordPress site, and we don't have dedicated staff for this. Um, so it's possible. Um, the second thing we've learned is that it's worth putting effort and resource into presenting collections as data. So we were overwhelmed by the response to the Data Foundry and back in 2019 when we launched it. I think we just thought we were putting out another um, resource, of, you know, more resources for people. We didn't think that suddenly it would take off on the same day and that um, people would be so positive about it. And I think it shows that there's, there's demand for, the, for collections as data, there's demand for this kind of work and for these kind of collections, and that we need to start thinking about how to resource that better. Um, the third thing I've talked about this already is that there's more to digitization than online image galleries. So we've been lucky that we could adapt to that and, and alter what we had to do. 
Um, the fourth one is around um, implications across the library that digital scholarship creates. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, this all this work touches upon the whole library because pretty much every team is involved in some way at some point. And that's actually been really positive and great because it means that we're, we're learning to work together in new ways that perhaps we hadn't before. But it also does mean that it, it impacts on people's time, definitely. And then lastly, historic practices affect everything. So the way that we've catalogued things, the way that we've created data, the way that we've digitized material, um, all impacts on what we can do with it in the future. And, and that does leave us with some challenges going forward too. So I think that's me wrapping up there. Yeah, thanks very much um, for listening to me. There's my contact details on the screen for anybody who's, um, I know, listening at a different time to me recording it now and looking forward to chatting more about this. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was amazing. Um, so uh, quite a lot <laughs> covered there in a short period of time. Um, those visualizations of <laughs> the visualizations of the lidar data are uh, absolutely stunning. They're amazing, and yeah, Sad Khan who did them is very talented, and it was a great opportunity for us to have the library itself scanned. Definitely, so we've got this amazing data set now that loads of things could be done with it. So. Very yeah, exciting. that's that's amazing. I, I I love that you're working with um, artists as well. That's um um a really uh a rich um uh vein of of uh of, of of what um uh possibly libraries don't necessarily think of i um i really really love that mm. it brings completely different perspectives onto the collections too which is great in ways that we just wouldn't think about presenting them to people so yeah, yeah. it's been really positive it is good to connect with different communities the students as well that sounds great too um yeah. Yeah, I have a question that I'd just like to ask, and I sort of touched on this a little bit in your presentation, particularly where you talked about working with those intermediate level users, but also with the internal skills that you or the internal culture change that you needed to do. Um, and I just wanted to talk about skills with these skills related to data handling and both in the sense of how have you what are your thoughts about where the responsibility of the data provider lies on ensuring that the user is capable of um, accessing these collections as they get bigger as they get more complex as they um and and where where do you see that um that responsibility lying and yeah perhaps a little bit of the internal as well that's related to that sure that's such a difficult question because i think part of it also Sorry. depends on what kind of library you are um, i think there's no right or wrong answer to i think maybe a university library has a clearer audience in that you've got researchers there um, you probably or hopefully have academics who are whose roles are to work directly with the researchers um, there should be some skills training roles whether they're within the library or not i'd hope in a university library so i think that there is a responsibility in university libraries to equip users um, with skills whether it's the, the library itself or other departments within the university to do that as a national library this is a really tricky one and we discuss it quite a bit um, so we're making collections available as data to users anybody can use them um, our audience is the nation and beyond um, are we also digital skills trainers for the nation and beyond uh, that's putting quite a lot onto onto our roles then when we're already under resourced um, so I think at the moment, our outlook is that we need to try and make our collections as accessible as possible. And that's why we've gone for firstly focusing on open data. So we're not putting any risk onto our users, even though that's quite quite resource intensive at our side um, to make sure that we can verify that, that our collections are open data. Um, and secondly, that's why we've gone for basic straightforward downloads. For example, we haven't gone for API access. We've gone for tiered downloads. We've gone for text. We've gone for CSV files as well as Mark XML and Alto XML and things. So we're going for accessibility. I think if we had more resource and if we had a developer dedicated to this, we'd certainly have outreach work around it um, where maybe we'd have workshops where you could start to um, to um, promote some digital skills. Um, at the moment, what we've decided is um, Jupyter Notebooks are quite a useful way to make collections available as data to and to explore them. Um, so of course, they're used in learning and teaching environments and um, a lot. And we're finding that we've only got about five or six of them, I think, at the moment. Um, but they're a good way for people who can't code or who are beginning to learn to code to start to explore them. And we could potentially take them into schools, for example. But I'm not convinced that we could just put them out for the general public and expect um, anybody to, to understand a Jupyter notebook. Um, so it's a really tricky one around um, how to serve all audiences as well as you possibly can on little resource. So I don't know what, what your views are on that, is what your libraries are doing. I think it's the question. It's that thing about, you know, um, just putting it up 
is not necessarily making it accessible and where where that boundary sits between the the, the provider and the and the user in terms of when when certain skills are needed to to access it like yeah how that I think it's a question that some other that we have yeah we're not we're at my own library we're not quite putting it up just yet so it's a it's a future question for us so yeah, um, it is a big challenging one. I think when you get bigger data sets too, at the moment ours are pretty much manageable. I mean, on some some laptops may not be able to cope with some, but um, as we get bigger data sets and downloads don't become as, as straightforward, then we're going to have to think about how to convey to people, how to communicate, um, how to start to explore these data sets and how to even get hold of them in the first place. So there's definitely challenges that we're, we're already facing and we'll be approaching more of, I think, as we go forward with it. Yeah, I think um, I think for us at the um, National Library in New Zealand, Te Puna Mātauranga o Aotearoa, I think we're also still grappling with what uh, what level to release and, um, uh, data sets, uh, what sort of formats, and who's going to use them, or what sort of skills they're going to need. You know, there are some data sets that are um, such as the Papers Past um, Corpus, which is our our main historical OCR. Um, uh, newspaper data set, um, you know, we have had been approached by some some um, uh, fairly advanced researchers to, to look at the whole the whole thing, which is a massive data set that we have not actually released as a whole thing. We've been we've released it in in um, in certain ways that are maybe not suited to that particular user group that that actually want to get get their hands on the whole thing. So. I think we're, you know, we're all still grappling with some of those types of questions. Yeah, it's really challenging around, as you say, it's the, those kind of advanced user groups who have supercomputer access or whatever, who can, who just want the massive data set, but is that going to serve the many more groups of people who want to access yeah, absolutely. much How do you make it available? Yeah, it's yeah. a good one to, to work out. Yeah. Rowan, did you have a question? Um, I do. Um, um, uh, and I just want to say also um, thanks to that presentation, Sarah. I, I feel like I've got a million questions, but we're, <laughs> we've got limited time. Um, uh, you you flagged the, the question of different types of data when thinking about collectors as, as data. Um, and I think you mentioned uh, towards the end, you know, uh, I like I like that, that uh, idea that, you know, it's not just all about image galleries. Um, so thinking about maps and audiovisual data, other types of data, has, have you been able to progress your thinking on how to extract from those data sets? Uh, you touched on places, landmarks, that type of thing, yeah, in so, an automated way. Um, and, and what sort of methods you've tried, if you have? So we've been collaborating with others around this. And I should say that my colleague, Chris Fleet, um, who's definitely worth speaking to, if you ever want another speaker at this, Chris Fleet's amazing. He's our digital maps curator. Um, he's doing the most amazing work with, with our maps service. And um, he's been leading on this more than me. Um, and he collaborates um, with a project called Machines Reading Maps, which is the Turing Institute. I think the British Library might be involved and others, um, I think some in the States too, um, where we're exploring um, and how different machine um, machine learning um, tools can start to explore maps and start to exploit maps, I guess. Um, and um, I think so far we're, we're reaching a lot of challenges around, um, you know, to what extent um, AI can help um, machines read maps um, and how, I guess, the, the time consuming nature of it. That at the moment we tend to use crowdsourcing projects to, to read our maps for us in that sense and create data sets around maps. Um, at the moment, the AI tools that we're exploring around this are taking almost the same amount of time um, in terms of resource as a, as a crowdsourcing project would. Um, surely that's going to change in the future as, as the tech changes, as, as, as work around this improves. Um, but I know there are researchers onto this at the minute, but currently our most successful outputs have been around um, crowdsourcing projects that Chris has been running around our maps instead, which is, isn't exactly a, a tool, I guess, exploring the map, but, um, but the crowd has been fantastic in that. We're certainly looking at automated ways um, that we can start to do this. But the issue, I think, is also that there are loads of AI tools, um, for example, that you could run films through to start to identify objects in films, which is a similar kind of data set to, a, I guess, what we're talking about with maps without the georeferencing. Um, 
but there's so many ethical issues around this of what might be identified mistakenly and how would you communicate this to your users again i think i wonder if this might be slightly different for um, a university library to a national library of um you can have certain expectations of your research audience and you can, you can explain things to your research audience that this is what we've done with this but when you've got a, an audience that is anybody um you need to be really careful about what you're putting out with your what collections you're putting out, what information you're putting out with them and what what expectations you're having on them to to understand what you've done with it. Um, so we're really cautious actually about what we do with our with our films and, and our maps, but particularly our films, for example, um, around identifying objects in them. And it's discussions we have ongoing at the moment. So I'd say we're at the discussion level around films and at the experimental level around maps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's great. It's it's I, I guess is that that transparency is the is the challenge yeah. is what you're touching on it's there yeah. yeah 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 have you have you experimented with commercial products because i know i asked that because we have um with image recognition commercial products and and yeah you you sort of start to immediately see what some of the challenges are there um mm -hmm. around accuracy and what they bring up but have you um have so you managed to experiment in that way or so this is part of what our AI framework is hoping to do. So we know there's things like AWS tools out there. Um, there's loads of like Microsoft tools and things too. We need to work out what tools we're willing to start to experiment with and what we're not. And things like black box tools, I imagine, might be off the agenda. Open source tools would be more willing to look at. There's the tools that, um, for example, I think I mentioned Giles Bergel, our first digital scholarship fellow. He's been developing these amazing open source tools with his team at Oxford. Um, that we're keen to explore more because they're openly available. Um, so I think that's part of what our next steps are in the framework of, of where are we going with this? Where are we willing to, what kind of tools are we willing to use and which ones aren't we? Um, so we've done kind of dabbling with different things, but we haven't really done anything that we'd put out to the public yet or anything. Great, thanks, Grant. Thank you so much to uh, Sarah Ames for that great talk uh, that we pre-recorded a few weeks back. Um, so thanks in spirit to Sarah. Um, rolling right along, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jessica Moran. Uh, she is the Associate Chief Librarian Research Collections at the Alexander Turnbull Library, Te Puna Maturanga o Aotearoa National Library of New Zealand. In almost 10 years of the Alexander Turnbull Library, she has worked first as a digital archivist and then head of digital collection services before becoming the Associate Chief Librarian in 2021. And I'd just like to add a really, a really great colleague to work with over the years. I've, I've um, uh, also been around a similar sort of vintage. So <laughs> thanks, Jess. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rowan. <laughs> Uh, kia ora koutou, katoa, e mihi ana, timana whanua, uh, ko kai puripuri, puka puka matua, to toko tuku toranga mahi, e mahi ana au ki te puna mataranga o Aotearoa, ko Jessica Moran toko ingoa. Um, hi, welcome. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here real quick, and I was just thinking, um, about how much I would like to have a look at the AI framework that Sarah was talking about. Um, it sounds like something that would be eminently useful uh, here at the National Library. Uh, bear with me. I, we totally practiced this and then I fiddled around and now I'm going through the process again. Um, so thank you. Um, as I introduce myself, and as Rowan has introduced me as well, my name is Jessica Moran, and I'm the Associate Chief Librarian for Research Collections um, in the Alexander Library, Alexander Turnbull Library, which is part of Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa, the National Library of New Zealand. Um, so this presentation this afternoon is going to have a brief look at some of our recent experiences with working to collect or create uh, data sets and digital collections at the Turnbull, um, develop an introduction to digital curation training in Aotearoa, and finally briefly talk a little bit about some of the open data that the National Library makes available um, and what we've learned about those process so far. 
Um, so this presentation may feel a little bit scattershot. I felt a little bit scattershot while I was developing it. Um, but I think on listening to Sarah and reflecting on what a national library is and the kind of space that we occupy, it makes a bit of sense um, because national libraries are very much, you know, focused, very specific in their focus on having that national identity and national memory, but also exceptionally broad in the sense of who we serve. So our researchers and their needs can essentially be everyone um, and anything. Um, so in the Turnbull and the libraries, we've been very focused in the last I guess decade, I would say, on building our digital collections and understanding how to manage and preserve them. Um, and now I think more and more of our attention, we're starting to think about how do we make them available? Um, so I'm really pleased that I am here this afternoon to share a little bit about where we are um, on that pathway. And also that I got to hear from um, Sarah and that hopefully, you know, that this group is around and I can learn from all of you um, as we continue to kind of work through how we will make our uh, collections computationally accessible. Um, but first, briefly, a little bit of background. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Turnbull Library um, and the National Library of New Zealand, the Turnbull Library is the special collections um, and archives research library within the National Library. Um, and our purpose, which all enshrined in legislation is develop the research collections and services, particularly in the fields of New Zealand and Pacific studies and rare books, and to develop a comprehensive collection of documents related to New Zealand and the people of New Zealand. Um, and also I think when we kind of are thinking about this talk and making our collections accessible, um, the other part of our work is to supplement and furthering the work of other libraries in New Zealand and working collaboratively with other institutions having similar purposes, um, including forming part of the international library community. So it's very lovely to be here with this international library community this afternoon. So to understand a bit more about our work to collect and make digital collections available, it's helpful to have a bit of understanding about our underlying infrastructure because I think that um, everything we do um, grows from this foundation. Um, and that foundation is the NDHA or the National Digital Heritage Archive. So it's, it's our preservation system, but it's also the, the support and the infrastructure, um, the policies and the business operations around how we um, manage and preserve our digital collections. So the library's made an ongoing commitment to digital preservation and that foundation is made possible not only to grow our collections, but also to grow this skill and expertise of those working with digital collections. So the talk, this talk today, um, it's gonna touch lightly on a lot of different activities across the library. So I just want to acknowledge that um, this is not all my work. This is that the library has a really strong um, collection of people working in digital specialist roles from digital archivists and web archivists, digitization specialists, um, our legal deposit team that spends a lot of time collecting foreign digital content and our digital preservation team and our digital experience team of which Rowan is a member. Um, and I think also the scale of our collections and um, because we have been in the position that we've been collecting digital for um, not quite 20 years, but really, you know, seriously for more than 15, um, we have we have at this point quite large collections that we are managing. Um, in May, our last count, 40 million files and over 500 terabytes of data. Um, so I thought I would briefly note a couple of our larger born digital collections that we've been building. The first is the New Zealand Web Archive. Um, the Web Archive, New Zealand Web Archive, is a collection of web archives that counts now around. 800 unique websites um, and 38,000 instances or versions of us, that site. So we might collect a website as a title, but we collect it regularly snapshots. So um, 38 version, 38,000 versions of those collections. And we also work with the internet archive to do an annual whole of domain web um, archives of the .nz domain. 
So access to these collections is currently by title through our catalog, um, but we are actively working to develop functionality to allow researchers to search and access the data sets of that whole of domain harvest um, because it's, it's, a, it's a huge collection and we are you know, working to kind of get a handle on it. And really the next thing that we want to do is um, make it much more accessible to researchers. Um, and I can't talk any more detail about that, but I think Andrea might be in the audience this afternoon. So she's a good person if you wanna know more about that. Um, and social media collecting, beginning around 2016, we've been quite serious about um, getting to grips with collecting social media um, in as much as that we can in the National Library. Uh, a key focus for us first was Twitter. And we created uh, Twitter data sets around a lot of different major New Zealand events, starting with the Kaikoura earthquake, um, but also general elections, the Christchurch mosque terror attack as an example, and more recently, um, our COVID response and experiences around COVID-19. Um, in 2019, we also ran a project to collect individual and personal Facebook account archives in order to better understand what was involved with archiving Facebook um, and understanding a Facebook archive as a data set of personal data. Um, part of this work was about understanding what was involved in doing that, but it was also about raising public awareness that this was personal data that could be found in your um, Facebook account and how you could manage that personal data yourselves. Um, and as I said, part of it was this technical understanding of how to collect it and preserve it, but also equally important. And I think that um, Sarah touched on this in her presentation as well, was working through all of the, the kind of ethical privacy and legal issues around not just collecting, but you know, ongoing uh, preservation and access to personal data sets like a social media account can essentially become. Um, and so this is just an example of one of our Twitter um, harvests as a data set, which was the Te Matatini um, Kapahaka Festival a few years back and how we've described the data um, and what is and isn't available for researchers um, right now. And essentially when we're doing these uh, Twitter harvests, we can make the tweet IDs publicly available but the data itself, you would need to get in touch with us um, if you wanted to use that data. Um, the other thing I thought it would be interesting to, to kind of talk a little bit about is, like I said, we've been grappling with how to make these collections accessible to researchers for computational access and just for access in general, really. Um, and as you can guess, it's not a straightforward question. So we want to provide good service um, and, and make these as easy to use as possible. But we need to also balance these ethical and legal issues around uh, making the content available. So to begin to understand what it was that researchers actually wanted when it came to kind of our big web and social media data, um, we conducted some research to, to go to look into that. And this research was led by Lena Osabag, who was working in our preservation research and consultancy team at the time. Um, and so we did a, a bunch of surveys and then phone interviews with a select uh, list of faculty who were involved in DH, as well as staff, including libraries and IT specialists. Um, and what we wanted to find out was, would these kind of data be of use to researchers? Um, and what sort of questions would social media and web archives help researchers answer? Um, and also what do researchers need? Uh, if we have our limited resources, where should we uh, apply them in terms of training, awareness, support and advice, equipment? Um, do they just want the data? Do they want the raw data, tailored data sets? Um, what kind of metadata and documentation would be of use? So what we found out was that most researchers, this is probably not a huge surprise, aren't using the library's web archive or web archives in general. Um, most are doing, are familiar with or are using some digital research methods and felt that the domain harvest and the Twitter harvest were relevant to their research, 
Um, but there was still some general confusion about what was actually in these data sets, um, what the formats that they were held in, and their potential for use. Um, so, but what we did find out was that researchers wanted downloadable data sets that they could use within their own infrastructure. Um, and they wanted all the metadata and the documentation that they could get. And in terms of kind of the, what sort of training and support they need, the majority thought that the library should provide raw data sets, network access, and mass storage, um, but less interested in the training and the software. Um, and nobody really wanted us to provide a physical space to do that. Most wanted just to get access to the data. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've kind of learned so far about what researchers want. Um, and that will help us as we continue to figure out how to provide access to these collections. So um, now I want to shift gears completely and talk a little bit about um, I think in my in the blurb, it was called building a Aotearoa digital uh, curation community. Um, and so how this work came about and what we have done to date. Um, we had kind of, there was a, a bunch of sort of convergence of things that made us think that we needed to develop a bit of a training program. And some of this started around kind of 2015. We were getting an increase in people wanting um, advice and training around kind of digital collecting, digital curation, digital preservation. Um, we knew we had people on staff that had the skills and the ability to give that advice, but we weren't sure how to direct their um, attention. And um, we knew there was very little formal training in digital curation and digital preservation within New Zealand's heritage sector. And at around the same time, um, OCLC had released a couple of reports about the state of capability for doing digital collecting and born digital um, collecting and preservation. And so we wanted to find out a little bit more um, about how we fit, sort of benchmark ourselves. And so in 2016, we ran a survey to find out, you know, how New Zealand institutions were doing around um, more digital collecting. And we found out that like a really big majority were either already collecting born digital material or were planning to very soon, but that few had any plan or um, kind of staff in place to do this work. So it seemed like a really good time for us to kind of develop a bit of a program um, and build that community. So what we did was we, we developed some really kind of hands-on workshops where we could provide a bit of background of the theory behind how you might want to uh, approach digital collecting, work with born digital archives, digital preservation principles that you want to keep in mind. Um, and then also make it very hands-on so that people had a chance to play in an environment where you know, they weren't gonna break anything, they weren't gonna damage uh, heritage collections, but they could get comfortable with, um, with some of the processes. So we started with two pilot workshops offering the principles of born digital collection, um, born, digital, born digital collecting. They were in Auckland and Dunedin. They were a roaring success, so we carried on through the next couple of years offering workshops around the country, um, including one at the Pabaka Conference in Fiji, which was a real treat. Um, and then we continued also to offer um, workshops specifically to different communities, to community archives, to iwi archives. Um, and I think at this point, it's also really worth acknowledging that at around the same time, I think around 2018, the OSPreserves network um, came into being. And that was also kind of an impetus that allowed the work to spread a little further. And we were able to get involved with that group um, and contribute to the development of training and workshops and really grow that network, um, not just in New Zealand, but uh, in Australia as well. Um, and one last thing that I wanted to share about some of this work. Um, so the work carries on. We haven't done 
I think we did an online workshop last year that Val ran, um, but because of COVID, we haven't done so many face-to-face -face workshops in the last while. Um, but what we did do was develop um, an online guide and a written guide. Um, it became clear that as we were working through this, that, that it would be helpful um, to have something written down around this instructions with the kind of New Zealand specific context um, for those who either couldn't attend the workshop or who had attended but wanted something to take away with them to refer to. Um, so the library developed this guide for managing digital collections. And I'm really proud of the work that the team did on this. So I just wanted to share it with you. Um, so this, this was developed by Valerie Love, Flora Feltham, and Vicki Ann Heichel here in the Turnbull. Um, and it was on the website here. Um, as well, that we, we produce pamphlets that we give out to people. Um, and we have both an English and a Tereo Maori version. Um, so they're really kind of targeted people really getting started with people working in community archives, iwi archives, um, and break down the principles of digital preservation and digital archives, um, easy to use steps. So if you're looking for something to help or you wanna share, please take a look at this, um, this website. Okay, shifting gears again. Um, so I've talked so far a bit about born digital collections, but I also wanted to mention some of our digitization work across the library. Um, the library across both the Turtles digitization, where we do a lot of in-house digitization of um, collection items, photographs, manuscript material, ephemera, um, rare books, uh, and then the National Library's digitization of books and newspapers. We digitize between 450 and 500,000 items a year. Um, and here on the screen, you can see our Papers Pass, which is our platform for accessing our full text uh, digitization collection. Um, so this is a very rich, uh, resource, and I'll come back to a little bit about what we're doing with Papers Past at the end. Um, the other big digitization project that we have going on right now is Utina, which is our audiovisual digitization project. Um, Utina is a joint project with our partners at Natonga Sound and Vision and Archives New Zealand, as well as our digit digit digitization partner, Memnon. And over the next few years, we'll be digitizing almost our entire AV collection here at the library. Um, just over 100,000 items, most of which are um, oral histories, music recordings, videos, uh, largely magnetic media. And um, in all between our three institutions, we're planning to digitize almost 400,000 items over the next three years. So at the moment, we're working really hard to prepare our collections. So making sure everything um, has enough kind of descriptive and unique IDs so that we can send it to our digitization partner. Um, and while it'll be a while before these collections will be digitized and available, I'm really excited about what digitization of such a rich collection of audio visual content will mean for researchers. Um, and we're especially be looking at how we can use computational tools to enhance access to these collections. And I've been paying attention to a lot of the work that people have been doing to um, experiment and look into using AI to develop transcripts um, and guides to provide more uh, thorough descriptions for audiovisual collections than the kind of very, very scant description that we're doing at the moment to make sure that we can get them digital. Um, so that is one area where we haven't yet started trying to use any AI on this collection, but we know it will be um, a potential rich source to enhance access. Okay, finally, um, I thought I would just briefly touch on some of the open data that the library already does make available through our website. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, this is our open data site on the library's webpage. From here, you can access our data either through API or downloading data sets. Um, kind of depends on the resource and what sort of uh, access is available. Um, and as you can see, there is 
the not Upoka Poka Tuka Tuka metadata, which is our Maori subject headings metadata, is available. Um, our index metadata, some papers past data, and for Turnbull data, there's two kind of main sets of data that we have released as data sets that you can download. These are our descriptive data and our name authority data. Um, and both of these are released as um, EAD and EACCPF um, XML data sets. So if you ever wanted to um, get a giant collection of metadata um, and then use it to connect to collections in other places, um, this data is available. I think so far, really, what we've seen is people um, playing with it on Wikidata. Um, but it is is a data source that that of Turnbull data that we have made available so far. Um, and the last thing I want to share with you is just a few details um, around a pilot we've now completed to share as data sets our pre-1900 newspaper data, not just through our API, which we've had available, um, but as downloads. So um, for this little bit here, all credit to the team that manages Papers Past as a platform, um, which is not me, and especially to Jason Murphy, who wrote up the report that I'm cribbing from here. Uh, for the pilot, we wanted to understand how people might use data, um, use this data, and also we wanted to better understand how useful the METS Alto format was as a way to make the metadata available. Um, and beyond just sharing what was available, two things that I thought would be of most interest to people was that we did confirm that METS Alto is quite difficult for some people to use. Um, and But the one that I found most interesting was that um, we discovered that a user had posted the data set to academic torrents. And from there, we were able to see there was kind of a knock-on effect of more and more people downloading it through the academic torrents. Um, so I thought I would just leave it on that because I thought it was um, a really nice example of how when you make available the data available and make it clear what can be shared, um, you see that thing where it, collections get into the hands of the people who want them. So um, that's all from me. I hope that was useful um, and thank you for having me. Thank you Thanks. so much, Jess. <laughs> Um, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, lots and lots of great work there to um, for very, everybody to dig into. Um, uh, we we are at time, um, so we probably don't have have any time for uh, questions uh, at this point. Sorry about that. No, no. That's okay. You <laughs> shared a lot of information. That's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I mean um, at all. Uh, I would um, just like to encourage everybody to get in touch with us if you have any questions for Jessica, um, and we can um, uh, connect you. Um, uh, maybe Ingrid, if you wouldn't mind sharing our the link to the uh, AUNZAI for Lamb um, uh, main site again. That would be the, the easiest way to get in touch with us. Um, and also we can help set up a maybe a community chat about any topics that you are uh, interested in. Uh, I would also encourage everyone to visit the links uh, that have been shared in the chat. Um, we will be uh, uh, making the recording available at some point once it's been tidied up. Um, uh, and we'll send that out to a link to that to all, um, uh, to our, all um, participants. Um, thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, there's one more thing. I'll let Alexis. Yeah, just one off. final thing. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for those. Uh, I understand if people have to drop off, but just one final closing note. We will actually have another webinar in August. So um, keep an eye on your email boxes because with this video, hopefully we'll be able to send a link for registration. And we will be joined by Jeremy Howard from Fast AI, who will be talking about teaching AI and machine learning methods to uh, non specialists. So um, that's a, another opportunity to, for us to discuss ways in to using these technologies in our work. Um, and so I'd just like to add my thanks to Rowan's, um, uh, to, to Jess, and um, thank you all for joining us today.